It's my privilege to be here with Ethan Hawke and with Maya Hawke, who have just finished principal photography on a rather extraordinary project. It's a film called Wildcat, based on the life and the work of Flannery O'Connor. As anyone that's followed me knows, I'm kind of obsessed with Flannery O'Connor. I think she's the finest, you know, Catholic fiction writer of the last century. So I was thrilled to read the script and thrilled to have the two of you on here today to talk about her and about her work and about faith and spirituality and all sorts of things. So thank you for being here. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you for having us. You're welcome. Hey, listen, first of all, how did you both get interested in Flannery O'Connor? So can I have just maybe a, a quick sense of what was you your access to her? Sure. Well, I think that just in some degree, um, my dad has known about and loved Flannery O'Connor for his whole life. Um, but I came to her from an English teacher in high school. I think it was my sophomore year. Mm -hmm. I had, uh, Benjamin Rudder was my English teacher, and he brought her into the class and um, uh, assigned some short stories. And we started reading them, and I really loved them. And they started wonderful debates amongst the yeah. students. Um, some people hated them. Right. Some people thought they were brilliant. Some people thought we shouldn't read them. And it felt like this activation yeah. uh, in in my community, in my classroom. And the way that everyone r rose and started mm -hmm. percolating with energy to think about work and think about art and, and our society and culture and what it meant, I got excited. Um, and then I went out to the local bookstore on by uh, where my dad lives books are magic and i looked for mm. more more of her work and i found the prayer journal yeah uh which then took me on a whole it's marvelous, journey isn't it? um yeah. i felt i was really working through a lot of pain in myself at that time we were just talking about it actually and mm. and struggling with ideas of wanting to be great um wanting to contribute something feeling like you weren't good enough, smart enough, you shouldn't, had nothing to contribute, you know, that kind of ego pendulum swing yeah. um, that we all work on and work through all the time. Yeah. And it, I felt so seen in her work and hmm. the idea that someone who I admired so much could ha hold so much self-doubt and self-hatred was r really moving to me at the time and, and really important. And then I brought it that uh, to the a film set where my dad was working and I was sitting in the trailer, which is my favorite place to be in the whole world. <laughs> Not my own trailer, someone else's. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I, I just, the, I, I, most people don't like it at all. Like, don't try to bring your friends to a film set. They'll mostly hate it. <laughs> but I think if you grew up your whole life sitting in trailers and watercoloring and walking around and going to crafty and like it becomes a real place of comfort. Um, so we, I was sitting there, and in between shots and breaks, I, we just started reading out loud from it together. And together had this idea that I should use it as my uh, audition monologues for drama hmm. schools, which I just decided to do. Yeah. And so we edited the journal together down from a, you know, a, a, a long journal into a two-minute monologue. And I felt like a real rebel because you weren't supposed to, you were only supposed to take monologues from the theatrical canon. Yeah. And, but I had this original piece of adapted fiction and I felt really like it was this incorporation of my more literary side and my yeah. performative side, which was my stress about going to conservatory was that I, I also love poetry mm -hmm. and, and writing and that was kind of the, the two paths for me and I, due to my inability to get a good SAT score, ended up deciding <laughs> to take one path over the other. Um, yeah. Which I'm, I mean, that's not really the reason. But uh, anyway, and it sort of stayed with us. And, uh, and it was a very, can I jump in? Yes, I'm done. Yeah. It was a very beautiful time in our life because you can imagine as a father how wonderful it is to watch, to watch Maya fall in love with Flannery O'Connor and have that bring her to her prayer journal. And the prayer journal is a very beautiful document about a very serious young mind's self-questioning and uh, her search and yearning for a connection with the divine. So as a dad, to see your 16-year-old daughter on her own mm -hmm. get so tur turned on by yeah. this, it was very beautiful and and to watch what was so beautiful about the monologue that Maya created out of the prayer journal was it was a very sophisticated piece of the, of the journal, which is, is the desire to be great an offense to God? Hmm. 
is, is that my ego? That, do I really want to be great in service of others or do I want to be seen as great to f serve my own ego? Mm -hmm. Which was a very odd and peculiar thing to put in a giant audition. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. do I want to get into Juilliard to be a big shot right. or do I want to get into Juilliard to serve the craft of acting? You know, and well, that comes through in the script to me very strongly because she was a very ambitious young woman, meaning she wanted to be a well-known writer. She wanted to work with, you know, publishers. And she didn't York. just want to be published. Right. She, she wanted to be Tolstoy good. She did. That was her problem. <laughs> but then she also knew that she would give honor and glory to God by writing a great story, that by crafting a great story, yes. that that in itself would give glory to God. And that's and the, that's St. Thomas, you know, of Aquinas. That's where, that's, right. that's, that's where in, I'll, I'll let other people talk, and, but, but no. in, in, oh, go ahead. in it's basic, the basic theory is that, you know, a lot of people go around the world and they go like, who am I? You know, I don't know who I am. And if you want to know who you are, you can make a case to be made, a very compelling case, that God is telling you who you are by what you love. Yeah. And if you get close to what you love, what you love expands. Mm -hmm. And in the pursuit of excellence, in any talent that you are given, that you are given, that everybody is given, right. in, in the expression of excellence at it, you do honor to your maker. Right. right. And I, I would only argue that she learned that. And I think that's what we try to do in the movie is, is tell a little bit of the story mm -hmm. of how you learn that. But ambition is wildly discouraged in women. Hmm. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, it's both totally embedded in our practice of our relationship with the divine, and it's also embedded in our relationship to society. And, um, a, and it's wildly discouraged. I mean, I probably, it was probably more encouraged in me than most women in the world. Hmm. Um, and I still had moments in my life where I said, I want to do something. I think I could do this. I wanted to, and someone was like, God, that sounds ambitious. Like, you know, like, 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 okay, you know? Um, and it's so, I think that it's a, a negotiation that she's going through yeah. within the prayer journal, within the script, within her, her life, that I think a lot of us can relate to is, does this actually make me a bad person? Hmm. and actually interrupt my relationship to my higher self, to, my, to the divine? Or does society want me to stay small um, mm -hmm. and want me to see myself as small? And have they created all these obstacles in the idea of what it means to be a good person, a good woman, that, um, so that I trick myself into thinking that being good is being small when it's not necessarily? Yeah, the, what is the right manifestation of pride, what is the you know? Because pride can be negative, and pride can be dignity. Right. Pride can be self-respect. Right. Pride can mean honor. And what is the right manifestation of, of artistic ambition? When you let the f you know the flames of your ego be fanned so much that right. everything is just in service of you. Right. With her work, the discipline inside of it is staggering. Mm -hmm. The the art when you when you really break it down sentence by sentence what she's trying to talk about and the fact she never takes the easy path. There's never, she doesn't leave you with answers. She presents you with, you know, you finish a story like Parker's Back and you know you're moved, but you don't know why. Yeah. And then you have to read it again. Why did that upset me so much? Yeah. Why did he get the tattoo? Why didn't she like the tattoo? Why, why is he getting a tattoo of Christ? Why is it so important to him? Why is, what, what is the, you know, he crashes his tractor against a tree and he really feels, and I'm very moved by that because a lot of times I think we are offered moments of grace. We are offered moments of enlightenment. And what do we do with them? You know, what is the right, we don't always respond right, right to the, Didn't what she we're say given. her stories are about the offer of grace typically refused. Yes, so yes, there's a, yes. There's a breakthrough of grace, but then Which, I don't know what to do with it. I don't know what to do I with it. Or I miss it, or I, and, I mess it up. I've had friends like that. I've had friends, I've had moments in my own life where you're, where you momentarily get it. Yeah. You get that you're a part of something much bigger, and it's like a, there's like a crack in this banal treadmill that we're mm -hmm. all on, and all of a sudden you see it, 
and how to take what you just saw felt in your bones. She has another great line I love, which is, faith is what you know to be true, even if you don't believe it. It's like your body sometimes knows something's true. Mm -hmm. You know there's a larger truth that your intellect can't yeah. quite grasp. Yeah. Um, and she has that other great line that if you could understand God, God would, God would be less than you. Right. And we, that's we, right from St. Augustine. If you, if you understand it, that's not God. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. it's much. And, and so her search and her ability to put the search into art yeah. that, that, right. that you then have to say, okay, wait, I, I have had moments of grace. Did I respond right? Did I know how to incorporate? And that's the great value of organized religion is to give us a net to kind of guide yeah. us of how, what to do with these moments and how, you know, but very quickly we go back to sleep and just do the... the well, no, quite right. And, and she knew, it seems to me, that grace in a fallen world usually hurts. Grace usually has to break into your life in some kind of painful way, which makes the, the stories hard. Yeah. I remember to Maya's point, years ago I, w I assigned A Good Man's Hard to Find in one of my yeah. theology classes. And it was a class for, we call the Doctor of Ministry, so a lot of lay people were in the class. And there was a lady who was a, a mother and a wife and, and very devout Catholic, and she said, why did you give us that awful story yeah. to yeah. read? Yeah. Yeah. And she meant it. Oh, yes, yeah, she, I mean, she oh, yeah. meant it oh, as yeah. a reproach to me, like, why would you, why do, would that? you do that? And it's, well, because grace <laughs> often comes in that painful way. It, it, has to break through something. Yeah, which, so we have the line in the movie, joy is sorrow overcome. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you, you know, that she doesn't make, you know, what's her line? Religion is not a warm electric blanket. Mm. It's the cross. It's the yeah. cross, right. And the cross holds the suffering of the world. Right. right. I mean, this is, this is a very profound symbol of human suffering. And uh, failure of community to they can be presented with the s child of God mm -hmm. and 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 crucify him like this is, we live in a fallen world it's like to make it all nice yeah. and make it all warm and fuzzy you're not really talking about faith you're not then, because the that's real not world. that faith you can't take into your daily life right because you're well, I was going to say, what, and I think what you were saying about organized, like organized religion, kind of applies to all community and all organization of of people coming together and having a a a community with which to reflect your experience back at you. And I mm -hmm. think that we are doing that in the movie of this understanding of the artistic community and artistic yeah. practice as some kind of practice of faith. And you know, even in and grace can come in these giant moments of, of being sorrow overcome or in these like violent stories but and and that is definitely the way that Flannery mm -hmm. sort of saw that happen but you know we were just driving up, up here for a couple hours in the car and on an iPhone speaker listened to a song mm -hmm. we both heard yeah. and both dropped a tear on the iPhone speaker and yeah. looked out the window and put the and and it felt like a tremendous moment of grace sure yeah. and and there is sorrow overcome in that in the past in the present and art artistic creation and a relationship to the singer and there's all kinds of W larger works at play in a micro moment mm -hmm. um, of, of, of grace and softness. Yeah, that's um, certainly true. And, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and so there's, and in, and in the community that we've built and that we share of like, of poets and singers and concerts we've gone to and songs we heard live and people, like there's, c community is what matters and where we can bring our perspective and our experience and our painful moments, our big moments, our, our lovely, wonderful moments and, and bring them to our community and see them reflected back at us. Mm -hmm. And and I think and that's- through sharing and we understand each other and we understand that our experiences are often not as unique as they feel. Mm -hmm that other people do know what we're going through. Yeah. And um, other people can understand. And when you feel understood, you feel the capability of understanding. Yeah. And, and things open up. I mean, and that's the value that we can give each other. Yeah, no, quite right. Yeah. Hey, tell me why Wildcat? Now, Wildcat's not one of her better known stories. It's an early story of hers. Yeah. Short, very short story. Well, maybe like, six, seven One thing pages. I feel like is this is our first interview about the movie. This is okay. our first yeah. public dialogue about something Good. we've been working on for a long time. And, I should make it clear that this is basic. This is the first time I have ever been hired to make a film. My daughter mm. fell in love with Flannery O'Connor, <laughs> and she wanted to play Flannery O'Connor. 
she was very moved by him for there's many, many obvious reasons um, and some subtle ones, but she met the people that own the rights and wanted to do it. And then she got on a Zoom and, and offered me a job of <laughs> would I want to, you know, yeah. would I want to direct such a movie? And, and write it. And, and, and I really... It's a big job. <laughs> I, what's, what's funny is I, I remember, you know, m my wife is my producing partner. We got off the Zoom and I was like, I, I can't imagine anything I would want to do more. Um, and it, it's strange that it's co coming at me from my daughter. Hmm. But I, do I want to make a movie about Flannery O'Connor? Yes. The answer is yes. And would I like to do it with you? Yes. And there's a joke about titles to answer your question. Yeah. Which is Richard Linkletter and I have worked together a lot. And when we were doing Boyhood, we just, you know, first we called it the 12-year project. Then we started calling it Boyhood. And we spent 12 years yeah. trying to think of a title for this movie. Right. And his joke is they either come early or not at all. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it's the first thought, best thought thing, yeah. which is... Maya was like, well, let's, why don't we call it Wildcat? Because, you know, she's a multi-dimensional. She is, there's something funny to me, humorous, about calling it Wildcat. Because Wildcat kind of makes you think the Wildcats and a cheerleader. Right. Or something that's kind of classic, kind of, <laughs> Which you know. Which would not be Flannery O'Connor. And then you can see Flannery with her crutches and her <laughs> right. scowl and her teeth and her right. anger and her poise and her ferocity. And, but there is a Wildcat inside this demure small, oh, polite, yeah. young woman. Oh, yeah. And, and so, and it was one of her first stories, and it just, I was like, that's the title. Go ahead. To me, what I, what I thought about it was that there, this idea of the kinds of women we see, um, when you think of wild, a, a wild cat and with yeah. a leading lady, like, you know, you see like Catwoman mm -hmm. or like this kind of like romanticized, eroticized version of like the feminine feline yeah. energy. Um, when you see a wild cat in the wilderness, yeah. um, I mean, there's, there's like a, you know, you maybe you mean like a lion or a puma or something and there's that, but a wild house cat or a, it's like a, they've got, things sticking in their hair and they're, it's barbed and they're hungry yeah. and they're usually sick um, because they've been like abandoned and neglected and like they've got stuff in their eyes and and they're angry and if you spark them they're, they'll bite you and and the, the and that's and certainly her so it's this and we don't see movies about women like that mm -hmm. um, we don't see that kind of m multi-dimensional gritty, gross femininity hmm. that exists very much, especially if you combine it with a wild intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, that's what that was about, is like this kind of woman, whether you like her or not, mm -hmm. whether you think she's a good person or not, what, like it, it doesn't matter. Like we should talk about her. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's, that's partly why I thought that that story and those words belonged yeah. under, you and know, it, below it her really face. related to the idea that Maya was going to be playing multiple characters. She's not just playing right. Flann Flannery O'Connor. She's also playing the aspects of yeah. Flannery that she put into her stories. So it was kind of this mult, you know, you could, we could have easily come up with a peacock theme or something about, about multidimensionality, yeah. you know, but the wildcat is a, it's, it's wild, it can go any direction. And I kind of felt like that's what her performance was gonna do. It was, yeah. we were gonna do not just Flannery, but all the aspects of a woman that are inside one woman. You know, and and that, we, that was the goal of the movie. Yeah, it's a remarkable part of the script, of course, how you weave together the life of Flannery at a particular moment. And then these various characters who do represent her in different ways, or different aspects of her. Well, I have to say, that's all him. I mean, the moment I, I brought this project to him, but and then a couple months later, we sat down at a cafe together. Because when I brought it, I was like, I don't know if this is possible. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I know this woman's life and yeah. what happened. And I don't know if there's a movie in, in it. Um, there's and the, there's brilliant language and stories. and but But I don't know if there's a movie in someone who grew up in a small town, dad died, like um, worked really hard, got a good education, got sick, came home, wrote stories, died. died. You know, essentially, yeah. like there's not it, a lot of friends in right. the story, there's not a love interest, there's not like, where is the movie here? And, um, and, so, I, and I didn't, so I didn't know if it was possible. And then a couple months later, um, we are sitting in a cafe and 
he presented to me this idea of how imagination, faith, and reality intersect and how we could tell that in a movie by interweaving the mm -hmm. stories and the life yeah. and show how within all of us we are a kaleidoscope, like a mandala of different people and different characters, different lives, and we take all those little bits of ourselves and we concentrate them into characters and create art so that we can live our lives through our expression. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's when I was like, oh, I definitely found the right man for the job. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, yeah. and, um, and, and not to mention just also one thing you left out was a big part of the reason that I even had the thought that we should do this together was because you were going through this amazing kind of personal journey of realizing how your your practice of the arts, your relationship to acting, mm -hmm. your relationship to your artistic community was your sp spiritual compass and your spiritual practice devotion throughout your mm -hmm. life, or, or at well, least a big part of it. Yeah, I, and that's what, I, you know. It so. hit me at a weird moment because I, I was just turning 50 and I, uh, I f momentarily w became extremely depressed that I felt I hadn't honored hmm. the part of my, when I was a young man, I was extremely interested in religion and faith. Hmm. It was very, very important to me. And it was uh, everything I thought about. And I felt like I'd never, how did I get to 50 and never hmm. get past first base with my exploration of faith. And then the clouds moved away and I realized that my dedication and to the arts had, had become the manifestation of that yeah. faith and that yeah. I wasn't on first base and I hadn't. And then Maya coincidentally calls him and says, you want to make a movie about Flannery O'Connor? Now Flannery was very important to me at that time period when I was young. Flannery, Thomas Merton, um, Walker Percy, uh, Dorothy Day, uh, you, you know, yeah. there, there, there were people that were really... That mid-century fl flowering of And that's of what my Christian parents grew up on. And so that yeah. when I was interested in aspects of faith, that's what they were giving. Which, right. That was what was important in my house. You know, those yeah. are the books that I found and um, Seven Story Mountain and, and so... When it was almost like a voice from the past coming from the f present future, you know, Maya's passion for Flannery, I was like, wow, interesting. What if I could revisit my 24-year-old self and where I was yeah. in my faith journey then with what I've learned about the arts in the last 25 years? And, and what if I could incorporate Maya's... Maya and Flannery have some... They have a kind of punk rock energy to their <laughs> sensibility. There's a ferocity to the way Maya thinks that I understand why she likes Flannery. And I thought, what if we could make a, a movie that Flannery would be proud of, that Maya would be proud of? See, yeah. I think what you're talking about is exactly what, what she saw. And I'll, I'll flip it around using Thomas Merton. Merton said at one point, a bad book about the grace of God is still a bad book. You know what I mean? It's, like it's, it's on the best possible topic, but it's a bad book. Yeah. Yeah. And I think of, of Paul Tillich, the Protestant theologian, oh, said, him. he said, uh, there could be more authentic religion in a Cezanne still life than a kitschy crucifix, you know? So an authentic work of art. And that's the, the Aquinas point you're making that she would have understood very well. And, and that speaks to what that woman in your class Yeah wants, what she wants from art, sometimes we all want this, yeah. is we want Thanksgiving dinner. We right. want to be made to feel better. Pleasant and we, and and we want, uplifting. And, and a yeah. true spiritual journey is going to help us through the real work of our life. Yeah. It's not going to be Thanksgiving dinner every day. Right. And you need a set of rules and a vantage point inside your body and inside your brain where you can navigate all the vicissitudes of life, right? And it's not going to be Norman. There's a place for Norman Rockwell, right. and I love it too. Right. But what Merton is saying, Merton was always willing to ask the tough questions. You know, I was thinking about him when you were, when she was young, and you were thinking like, all right, I really want to be a writer, and I really want to be an actor. I love music, and I have to choose. And, I, and the truth is, you don't have to choose. Hmm. 
You need to work on yourself and let it take care of itself. And Merton had this, ter- you know, his journals are so moving about his mm-hmm. desires to be a writer and his desire to give his life to God and feeling like he had to choose. Yeah. And then the journey of his life is, he, what did he do? He became one of the great Catholic writers. Right. He actually could have them both. He just needed to do it step by step. And his first abbot saw that when he first joined the monastery and he thought, okay, I'm done with writing. I'm done with the New York thing. I'm, I'm a Trappist monk. But his first abbot, who's great credit, said, no, no, I want you writing. Keep writing. And then it took him, as you say, a while to kind of grow fully into that. Yeah. But I think that's what Flannery got to, that she was trying so hard to write a, to write, write a perfect story, write a beautiful, a cr- beautifully crafted story. That's and what that she gave felt honor she, to God. That's what she felt honored. Yeah. Uh, uh, honored yeah. God. And that she didn't have to honor God by telling one lie. Right. You, you know, I'm not going to tell these stories about perfect people. Yeah. I'm going to tell stories about the world I live in and how that, and like the Cezanne painting, that right. is spiritual art. I'm going to really look at this apple. I'm going to really look right. at this woman, this person, this situation. I'm right. going to look at it hard. Right. And that's honoring, that's honoring the Lord. And she's yeah. got that, which I, that comes through to me very strongly in the script, which is great. Um, let's talk a bit about the stories, because you, you wove in there some of my favorite of her stories. Uh, they're all marvelous, you know, and they all have that, that spiritual power to them. Like Parker's Back is one of my favorites, and that, that comes up a number of times, actually, in the script. This man who has a prophetic name, so he's, uh, he gives his Obadiah name Parker, Elihu. Yeah, Obadiah Elihu. So he's a prophet, and that's a big theme in Flannery O'Connor, is can you live up to your prophet's identity? And see, it's right in the theme we've been talking about, because to be a prophet means you're going to speak God's word. You're, you're going to do the authentic thing in your life rather than what pleases the crowd or what pleases, you know, whoever. And uh, can you do that? Can you bear the, the prophetic identity? You know? Most of us are human beings and most of us fail. Yeah. But the attempt is yeah. value. You know what I mean? Parker, uh, my wife and I like read that to each other out loud and it was, I found it, for those people who don't know, it's very simple. A, a young couple kind of falls in love. They're looking for each other. He has covered in tattoos. Mm-hmm. He's kind of a troublemaker. She's very devout. And in trying to please her, right. he get, it's, it's this amazing idea. We often love people the way we want to love, mm-hmm. not the way th- they need to be loved. Yeah, right. So to please her, he gets yeah. a tattoo. She, yeah, yeah. He, she loves Jesus. So he gets a tattoo of Jesus. She doesn't like tattoos, buddy. <laughs> Anybody reading the story knows as he's going to get this tattoo, like, she's not going to like this, you know? Yeah. But, but there's something beautiful about it that you can't put your name on because is, is it the inner Christ within all of us that's appearing in his back that she who claims to be devout turns away from? Yeah. Is it, is it, is he lost? And he has this very true spiritual moment. And instead of taking the moment, absorbing it and going to his wife to talk to about the moment, he gets a tattoo about the moment, <laughs> which, which is like everybody's, there's so much miscommunication, there's so much real earnest desire for healing and good that gets miscommunicated and ends up hurting. Go ahead. It is, and it's, a, it's a trendy thing to talk about now, but it's like, you know, in the idea of virtue sig- sig- signaling. Yeah. Have you heard that expression? Yeah. yeah. And there's all kinds of different signaling that we do to each other yeah. and for each other. I'm a good person and because I think X. I'm a good person because right. I think X. I'm, I'm this, I'm a tough person because I have tattoos. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a sweet person because I, my collar, my, I button my collar up all the way. Um, I'm, you know, and so we have all these ways that we communicate with each other that we're trying to show people what we want them to think is on the inside by putting things on the outside. And I think that the Parker, Parker's back is an interesting story in the way that it serves the movie because in, in my opinion, in most of the stories, Flannery sees herself in one character more mm-hmm. than the other. Um, yeah. From my point of view. I mean, I'm sure she would, you know, spit in my face. I, mean, I don't know, but, um, uh, but in Parker's back, I think both of them 
are two sides of the same coin mm. of a negotiation that my idea of Flannery is ha having with herself, mm. um, which is about, do I want people, do I want to behave so that people know who I am on, from the, when they look at me from the outside? Do mm -hmm. I need everyone to understand me right away? Yeah. Or do I want to be perfectly good on the inside and not care what anybody thinks of me? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Sarah Ruth is this, kind of practicing pious person who under like who's uh, more humble and taking care of her family and has this you know and wants love and has bound you know has, has boundaries and um and then Parker is this audacious who mm -hmm. paints himself yeah. and 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 it wants everyone to see drinks him too much and drinks and too much wants everyone to see him loud. know who he is yeah, um, he's no saint I mean, no no saint yeah. at all no and and he, and he's and he he's signaling that he's you know he's got this name and he's he's signaling to her this is who i am this is who i am this is who i am and i so i i think to to me what that story becomes about is how do we feel about the way that we're seen and um, and can we ever be and seen for who see we really are? And yeah, exactly. And can, and we, can, see, can we see How come others? she beats him in your judgment? So he, she sees the image of Christ, this kind of fierce Byzantine Christ, not a friendly mm -hmm. Christ. And then she beats. To me, the most moving part of that story is that when the image then begins to the welts form and the it's blood comes, and so Jesus himself, you know, bleeding on his back. Well, obviously, as an actor, you have to separate yourself a little bit from the metaphoric landscape and get into the human yeah. nitty gritty of what a person's motivation yeah. would be How to do such a that? thing. And, uh, in the scene before, um, she, she, he goes to kiss her hand and she hits him. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, we d decided to do that, and and it really started to inform the character. It was just a joke bit yeah. that me and Raphael, who plays Parker, came up with, and um, uh, and and as soon as it happened, it felt totally right to me, and. Sarah Ruth would have grown up in a world of violence, and so would Parker. Um, yeah. A world I did not grow up in, um, yeah. you know, but a world where people hit each other. And that was a part of the landscape of communication and even potentially the landscape of love um, in, in, in where those people are mm -hmm. and when they are. Uh, and so, first of all, I think within the context of that world and those two people, her hitting him with the broom is maybe more ordinary, um, you know. It's so extreme. Then it might feel to us. Yeah, yeah. Um, is maybe m more ordinary, um, and 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 so there's that. And then if you connect it with the metaphoric feeling of where the emotion comes from, I think f in the way that I tried to play it and felt as her in the moment, a profound feeling of being mis misunderstood. Um, you don't understand my faith. You don't understand my life. You don't understand how to be my husband. Um, you, you know, he, he's coming you would back get that from that tattoo. You don't understand my faith or me at, at all. all. And all you know, all she probably would have wanted was him to come home on time, mm -hmm. right? Like, and not come home drunk, not come home in the morning, like, and have left her <laughs> to suffer and and wait and wonder as when she's pregnant, like, and in, instead he's trying to love her in this way that's so not, and and it's, it's and it, and so. It's, it's very interesting, too, that Flannery puts a broom in Sarah mm -hmm. Ruth's hand at the beginning and end of that story. Yeah. And the broom is kind of an old-fashioned symbol of the matriarchy, right? The person who cleans the house. And there is some matriarchy mm. or patriarchy war happening. Totally. Of what is the right power dynamic. You know, he's really into Sarah Ruth until she gets pregnant. Mm -hmm. Pregnant women were not, not his not favorite his thing, kind. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know? right. and, and like this, like, well, now she needs him. Now he doesn't want to be needed, so he wants to, he still wants to be loved and adored, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, that happens to a lot of men when they fall in love and get married, and then they, the, the, the mother begins putting her adoration on the child, and the male yeah. is lost. It's a, there's some symbol of matriarchy, patriarchy yeah. going like this. There. And to me, that's a war within Flannery, too. Yeah. That she grew up with these women who were more, like, traditionally feminine roles. Um, and, and then she has all this ambition and drive that is in the world of men in her time, you know, and, mm. and still in some ways, but in, in her time for sure. And so, and, and is her desire to be a great writer, to, to paint pictures, you know, he's got pictures of them, she paints pictures mm -hmm. um, and puts them up on her wall yeah. and it paints 
paints pictures in her stories. And, and is that desire a masculine desire? And is it a desire that betrays and breaks the... And she's also trying to paint a picture of God with her art. So there's something yeah. I always felt that she saw herself almost more as Parker. Yeah. We could talk yeah. about these stories forever. forever yeah. No, no, and that, I, I think, th right, that's the, the richness of it, of course, because I, I see him too as a guy that's discovering a prophetic vocation. He's a, ashamed of his name. He won't yeah. even reveal yeah. his name. Yeah. He's Reveals ashamed it. of being a humble servant of God. Yeah. Right, and then he bears the image of Christ. So that's all of us, right? That we, we have the Imago Christi in us. And what's that like to bear that? Well, it's always going to be a painful thing. Wait, I don't know thing. what that is. The, the image of Christ. The image oh. of the, Christ. The, the divine within. Okay, cool. Yeah, that we're all, as it were, she would have believed that, of course, as a Catholic, all stamped with the image of Christ. And so what happens when you start living that out? And one of the signs of it is you're going to get an awful lot of abuse. You're going to get rejected. You're going to get oh, rejected. And, 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 and so he does he, have a spiritual moment with that tree. This is the way he manifests. That's why I feel like sometimes I feel like that tattoo is actually the inner Christ manifesting right. on his back. And she, the devout one, rejects it. And that's the complicated world yes. we live in. No, and I think it was, it was really helpful uh, because it's typical of Flannery O'Connor. There's never a, you know, simple-minded explanation. And she would reject as soon as All you, of yeah. these characters are multivalent and they're good and bad. They're fallen and saved. Each one is an opportunity of grace for the other, you know. Yeah. Could you say the, the, you know, the face of Christ on Parker's back is an opportunity for grace? for his wife and she doesn't well, do it. Well, could have brought them together and, Right, and he's had opportunities for grace that she's offered and he's mm -hmm. rejected. So I, I think that's typical of her it's, modus tried, operandi. I had a very interesting, do you know um, Tehard? Sure, um, well, all that rises must converge. Yeah, well that's where she got that title from. And he had a big impact on her writing at the end of her life. And it's interesting that I'd say about Six of the seven stories that we drew from are, mm -hmm. are after her influence from him. Yeah. And, and yeah. There, well, whether it's his influence, I, I don't know. It's, she was maturing. She yeah. was maturing in, in, in her writing and, and really, really deepening. And I tried to pick, I didn't know that, I didn't realize that I'd selected six of seven that were like the last ones she wrote that happened were, yeah it, it happened just accidentally i was looking for the ones that i saw the most of her in mm -hmm. you know and it, interestingly enough she was more interested in what i like the third person really studying other people and she started looking more and more inward you yeah. know enduring chill is a scathing self-portrait yeah you know good country people is a scathing self-portrait let's talk about that a little bit because it's one of my favorite good country people and it's it's portrayed vividly mm -hmm. in the in the script uh a character she often goes after is the sort of self-important overeducated intellectual. You know, intellectual i wonder why i wonder yeah. why <laughs> and so here's this woman whose real name is joy but she changes Change it to, it to Holga, Holga to be the ugliest name possible <laughs> right and she well, has an artificial leg. The bottom part of her leg had been injured in a... In a you know. And they're in Flannery's walking around on crutches right. herself. So right. it's like and the story culminates in this rather wicked fellow, a uh, Bible salesman who does, actually doesn't believe in God or anything, and steals her leg from her, right? mm -hmm. steals the artificial leg. Um, I mean, it's so heartbreaking. It is a heartbreaking story. But yeah. uh, talk about that thematically a little bit. How did you see that as reflective of well, either I Flannery herself? I or found this? in her letters, she wrote to a friend of hers that this, this was her um, foray into uh, the most autobiographical character she yeah. had, had written. Yeah. And I found that, and then you start thinking about it and it is pretty obvious. You know, the mother says to her, I know you want to be off somewhere right, right, <laughs> working on your PhD. And, you know, it's... Her the, mother is all over the stories, isn't she? Flannery's uh, well, mother is all over the And that's the other the reason why the stories I picked is where, where do I see Regina yeah, as right, well, right. you know? And, um, you know, and it's obviously Flannery would bucket that. It's not Regina. It's not autobiography if right. she wanted to write. But she's taking, she's, she's putting aspects of herself under yeah. the microscope. Yeah. And what's fun, what the, in classic Flannery style, yeah, he is a wicked guy selling Bible sales, Bibles who doesn't believe in God. But... In a way, she's just as wicked. Yeah. Because oh, she sure. thinks she's so much smarter yeah, than him. Absolutely. That she's going to seduce him and kick him aside right. because play with him like a cat. Right. And and what and, and she ends up getting played with. And there's a there's a funny line that we put in the movie that it's actually taken from one of her letters about. I find this endlessly amusing that she finds that story really funny, Flannery, because she says to her friend, "What's more." 
Uh, what's more comic than a proud, angular woman uh, <laughs> approaching God inch by inch with grinding teeth, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Y you know, in that we, humility, humility, right. humility, humility, humility. <laughs> right. And she's trying to teach herself humility yeah. through that story. No matter how smart you think you are, yeah, yeah. it doesn't matter. And the, ahead, the interesting thing that I feel like we learned while exploring putting the story up, you know, acting, acting it out, it out yeah. which is one of my favorite things about doing the whole movie is how much you learn about a story and how yeah. deeply you get into it when you have yeah. to portray it. It, ch it changes it so much and it's why I love movies and plays and acting, you know, as much if not more than like the written word because mm -hmm. you get so deep, um, you know, when you're doing it and find new levels and the thing I found about those two characters of, you know, of Holga and the Bible salesman, he says he doesn't believe in God in the end. Mm -hmm. Is he telling the truth? Yeah. Who was knows? he telling the truth in the beginning? <laughs> yeah. Wh which one was a lie? Were they both yeah. a lie? Right. Does he even know who he is or whether or not he believes in God? And, and with her, it's the same. Like, she projects this idea that she's so competent and strong and independent mm -hmm. and doesn't believe in anything. Is Does she? Yeah. Is it true? Right. Like, what does she think about when she's going to bed at night? And how does she really feel? And she even has that line to her mom in the beginning, do you ever think about what you're not? God. Yeah. And, now, and then she goes on to talk about it. She doesn't believe in God, but she clearly does. Yeah. Um, with that statement. Yeah. She unveils, like, that there is something greater that you're not. The, yeah. And, and, right. and, 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 and then she covers it up. So it, her, I mean, that's where her writing, that's where she reaches another level because right. nobody is two-dimensional and everybody's multifaceted. No, quite right. Yeah. And she's so good at that. And if we follow the basic rubric of, of the you know, the offer of grace usually refused. I mean, so there the offer of grace to my mind is the stealing of the leg when her leg is stolen. That's the opportunity of grace. And it's, it's offered by this. And that is, you know, what's that, that line, um, uh, when people talk about grace, they like to omit the fact that before it heals, it cuts with it the sword cuts. Christ came yeah, to bring. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And that that, sh that moment of her leg being taken away is actually, yes, painful, a giant opportunity right. for growth. Right, right. And, and, and like, she and can't I, move with that same confidence, and she, she can't. can't she, she is, clamors up the ladder to get to the loft, and you know, and she and the guy says, "Well, you can't do that. Just watch me do it." And yeah. the, so the confidence there is undermined, and there she's open then to something. As you say, the humility is introduced. And you, we could, in, in reading it out loud, you came to the theory that it probably what prompts Manly to steal the leg is her looking down on him. Yeah, right. That if she hadn't have looked down on him, yeah, you know, because <laughs> right. she spends the whole time saying she doesn't believe in God, and then she's angry at him when he says, I don't either. What he's saying is, I don't either. Yeah. Why is she mad at him about that? Right. Like, because she looks down on him. She doesn't think he could possibly be as intelligent as her. <laughs> right. And that makes him so angry. You, don't, you think you're so smart? I'll take your leg. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and then there's this Go whole other, other level there where she, she's mad at him because he lied. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. what, and what lies signal um, when, people when people start changing in front of you. You said this, oh, but now you mean this? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm not safe, right? Yeah. There's like a slow... Um, a slow beginning of a realization that you're not safe, which she isn't, and is also why she doesn't want him to take off her leg. Um, because in the, the, the having of the leg is your power. Yeah. It's your ability to move, your yeah, ability to right. run, your ability to get down from the barn. Right, to get away from she has to. what right. he wants, and a part of why I think he wants to take her leg, he wants, to, take he wants to disempower. Yeah, right. um, and um, and so and that gets and you know the fact that they're going up Although into this hayloft. Although it is complicated, he does want to. You're right, but she's so smart. There's another thing he says that is very moving about it, which is it's what makes you special. Mm -hmm. And I want to get to know. I want and yeah, like right. and that is. Now that's why she, everything yeah. is so complicated. I mean, we could talk about it forever, but then it's like well. Yeah, having the, it might be what makes you special, but the part of me I love is the part of me that, like, I, you know, I'm not ready for that level of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And, like, I want you to love also, me and my earned, strength. And yeah, you haven't earned it. You haven't earned that and vulnerability. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and then, of course, like, the vulnerability is given, and there's this moment of, like, potential relief of, like, being seen and loved and cared about, and then it, it cuts with a knife, and then your strength and power is taken. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think, to me, the, the story is such an intense 
metaphor about male and female sexual dynamics. And like, of course, they are up in this hayloft and have, you know, having this moment. Which is the iconic kissy right. kissy yeah. place. Yeah. And, yeah. and so right. it's like, oh, am I gonna give you my vulnerability in exchange, will you take my power? Mm -hmm. um, like, where will it leave me? How will I feel? Yeah. Um, and like, is that what we want a sexual exchange to be? No, like, we, like how can we fix it? it like, you know, so there's this, I, I don't know. Uh, to me, it's this, why we're still talking about yeah. it 70 years later. Because right. it, 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 yeah. if you dig in, it, it, it really gives your own, It prompts your own brain to engage, and I think that's what great art does: is it invites, yeah. invites you, the if you're watching a movie, invites you to be a part of it. Right. Y you know, a very similar story is one of my favorites, which is Revelation, and that is features in the uh, script too. It's a similar dynamic, isn't it? I mean, so Mrs. Turpin is someone who's utterly confident in her piety and in her And she's virtue and, signaling and virtue over signaling the wazoo. Like how, yeah, how, yeah. How, While nice secretly wishes everyone in the room would go in a gas oven. We hear the inner monologue, <laughs> monologue which is, you know, hypercritical of everybody in the room. But then the delicious moment, I, I presume you, you play Mary Grace, right, yes. in that mm -hmm. scene. So here's this kind of disheveled looking uh, young woman and Mrs. Turpin sees her as a, you know. She's reading human development. Human development. <laughs> and of course then she hurls human development across the room and hits Mrs. Turpin over the eye. And what's the line? It's um, go back go to back hell. Go back to hell where you came, came from, from, you warthog. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And of course, the fact that her name is Mary Grace, you're not gonna miss that. So again, yeah. <laughs> Grace breaks through, sometimes very painfully, <laughs> and coming from often very dis disagreeable people, you know. And, and that raises a very interesting question that she wrestled with, which is the problem of suffering in its different way, the problem of evil. Why would God allow so much wickedness in the world? Well, one answer, one angle is sometimes it's precisely through wicked people that breakthroughs occur. God, God uses even people's sin sometimes to cause a breakthrough in somebody else. It's very complex, and it's, but at its simplest level, death. Why do we have to die? Like one of the things we yeah. all think, like we all see death as as a dark thing, and we see friends die or young people die, and yeah. we see this, and, it, and it's like, and it's so counterintuitive. But if we don't die, we don't live. Yeah. So there, there. That's where, if you could understand it, it's not God. Like, right. for for goodness to exist. Yeah. For there to be a developing, healing, loving power. For love to exist, yeah. anger and malice, there has to be a counter energy or it's not love. And no individual is one or another. Like there is no, yeah. even within the stories, no, even within right. characters, Mary Grace isn't good and Mrs. Turpin no, isn't evil right. or vice versa. Both they are mix. both right. fully They're, complicated and yeah. in discussion and dialogue with each other yeah. and with themselves. I mean, Ruby, T Mrs. Turpin needs a book thrown in she her does. head. She, she does. really, <laughs> really, <laughs> really, <laughs> really does. She really needs somebody to throw a book at her. Right. And, and then the amazing moment at the end of that story, she's so judgmental about every race, every person, everything, just wickedness. Categorizing and, people. Categorizing right. Everybody, and <laughs> right. then she sits and has this. You know, she hears the chorus oh, the of crickets screaming hallelujah with their every, every chirp. She has this vision of heaven, and the thing, yeah, she can't believe people of other races are being allowed mm -hmm. into heaven. She can't believe it, even lunatics. Yeah, right. You know, and of course, it's so. When you read it, it's it's it is funny, but it's the idea that w we don't accept crazy people get to go to heaven. <laughs> right. You know, like, yeah. how could that be? Yeah. And where even their virtues are burned away. The single we, greatest line in my judgment, if Flannery O'Connor is, is, is that one, it, it, even their virtues are being burned it, away. Because we take such pride yeah. in our virtues. Right. And right. if they are virtues, they are not ours. And, and they gotta be burned you, you, away. You, you, you know, I mean, right. they don't belong to us. Yeah. You don't, you know, that's why the peacock is the great symbol, you know, that as if they were responsible for their feathers. Yeah, right. Right? That's all of us. You sing a beautiful song. The reason why you can't let your ego get carried away with being a fabulous, great artist is because it's not, it doesn't belong to you. It's like uh, the Jeff Tweedy quote. Jeff yeah, Tweedy, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, tell him, it's, it's, Jeff Tweedy ahead. has this great quote about um, when you realize, when people are singing your words, it, it can be very moving and like, yeah. wow, a whole thousands of people singing my words. And then you realize they don't love my words. They love rock and roll. Yeah. They love to come to show. They love poetry. I didn't invent poetry. Mm -hmm. I didn't invent the G C G D A chord progression. <laughs> yeah. This thing's a winner every time. Right. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, they love coming to concerts and I am part right. of this collective dance. 
and um, it's it, 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 and <laughs> yeah. when you have a humility like that, then it, it it relaxes you, and you're not taking responsibility for your feathers. There's a great uh, great playwright I worked with once said like, the problem with a the author being at rehearsal is the other people in the room think the author is there. Right. If the author's any good, they were actually witness to, you know, what he called the flame of Dionysus, but he means the holy muse. Yeah. Right? It's you, not you me, know, it's something it's, If I did any good at all, yeah. it's that I, I, I worked something that was given. And your job as actors is to witness that same flame. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you should go left or right. I don't know when you should, I don't know what costume you should have. I mean, I have ideas, you, you know, but I'm not right. And, and that's, that's humility again too, right, you know. When Merton comes to Gethsemane, so he's just beginning his monastic you know, career, and he says, I, I thought at first I've really undergone this great change. I'm a great virtuous man. Then I realized that my pride has just become spiritual pride, and my mm -hmm. gluttony has become spiritual gluttony, and my lust has become spiritual lust. And, you know, and, and that's that idea, I think, of, of your virtues being burned away. Of course, your vices have to be burned away, but then your virtues, too, are getting in the way maybe more than your vices are. Because your vices can lead you to the oh, liberating how many, collapse. How many, how many right? people have we known who have survived addiction right. that become some of the wisest, right. most compassionate, They're, most loving people? I mean, that, that path of when people suffer through self-inflicted addiction yeah. is some of the most wise people I know right. are people who have, I, who have lived, who have come to wisdom through great suffering, yeah. even if it's self-imposed, you know? And the real danger is that kind of pharisaical danger of, no, I'm, I'm good, you know? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, time and again in her story, it seems to me. It's as soon as you think you're good, says, you definitely oh, no, I'm, lost I'm okay, I, I don't need to be saved, you know? Yeah. And then grace, yes, you do need to be saved. And Grace might knock you down and, and you know, uh, throw you off kilter. It kept humbling him through his life. I mean, that's so, as life does, you know, there's a, another great Flannery line about um, the more you, mystery doesn't evaporate the more you learn. It, it deepens, it, it deepens, opens, yeah. It actually right. opens. You think you're, but it, it, it doesn't. And, and I find, you know, watching, I watched Maya play last night. She played a concert for all these people who really love her music. And there I was, and I, here in my 50s, having a feeling I have never had before. Hmm. A feeling I don't understand. Feeling I have no name for. Uh, I don't have the vocabulary for the feeling of watching other beautiful young people sing along to a song that my daughter wrote and watching yeah. her thrive yeah. and watching you excel at what you do and and it, it, it almost you remember when you're like 13 and it's the first time you notice that like girls are pretty you're like what is this feeling like you don't you're not it, it's like a new feeling yeah. right you're like right. What, what how do i mean that's how i felt watching you play i was like what i don't know what this i don't know where this feeling goes <laughs> yeah. i don't know what it and it's, it's a feeling of growing up. It's a feeling of like, well, I, my role is changing. You know, I used to go yeah. to rock concerts. Right. I used to, yeah. you, you know, I, like, and, and now I'm the dad at a, a rock concert. different texture opened and like, up there. And I can, this is an amazing opportunity. This is, I've never been here before. This <laughs> yeah. is really cool. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but it's, it does, it's like a bat to the head a little bit because it knocks you out of your, you know, the, plateau you've been walking on for right. a while. It's forcing you somewhere else. Yeah. And I feel Go like ahead. it's a great misunderstanding about like life that you ever graduate. I've been, I mean, mm -hmm. I think about this all, like that there's, that there's a, any kind of plateau that you reach. Yeah. And I feel like it's a bill that you get sold throughout your teen years or like, and, and you're like, don't worry, middle school's terrible, high school will be better. Yeah. Like, don't worry, high school's the terrible. worst. Terrible, you get to like, college, you can have a great time. Hey, hey, college, oh, yeah. college but, but, sucks, but, but soon you'll be out. Growing up and it'll be great. Like, <laughs> yeah. And this idea that we keep, that, that there's gonna be some place you're gonna get, where yeah. all of a sudden everything's gonna make sense and nothing's gonna change anymore. And at least so far, yeah. I don't think that's yeah. true. Like, I, I know. Well, it's one right. of the things, what I love <laughs> about um, the monastic life when I've studied it, like when I'm mostly through Merton, is there's a, a constant process of mentorship, of work, like yeah. you're, you're constantly working towards the next level. You're, you're a novice, you're this, you're, there's this. And I felt the same way in with um, P. 
piano maestros, like real, that, you know, yeah. if you're a 22 year old great piano teacher, you're coaching eight year olds. Mm -hmm. When you're in your 40s and you're at another level, yeah. minute, you're coaching the 25 year olds. When you're 45, you have a teacher who's 80, who's, and he, there's this feeling of constant education. Yeah. And, and I wish we had that. I mean, I, I talk about this a lot with acting because we don't have a culture, you know, of mentorship we, we, and apprenticeship. We and, don't. And, it, yeah. and it, what happens is, you've seen it, I've seen it, young actors who show an incredible amount of talent. And society can make a lot of money off that talent. Mm -hmm. So all they do is nurture the negative aspects of that individual's personality yeah. to get yeah. them through the next show, the next way to make them. Yeah. And nobody is taking responsibility for that young person's artistic development so that when they are 72, they fulfilled their potential on this earth and this journey around. And that goes back to our earlier point. They need a spiritual mentor because that's a, it's a we craft all, that's being developed it. and the to arts, see it as something sacred in your life. Y I've often told my this, you, you can't, it's not a job by job basis. You know, yeah. she's like, how do I do this job? It's like, you do this job exactly the way you're going to do your whole life. It, it's, it, this is, this, this job of playing Flannery O'Connor, this job of seeing mm -hmm. this concert, these are stepping stones in your development yeah. as an artistic person. And if you start seeing yourself on that long walk, then you survive the bad job, the, the big highs. You know you're not yeah, that yeah. good. You right. know you're not that good yet. Right. You, you're well aware of it. But, you, but then they attack you. I'm not that bad either. That's, right. That's not true. <laughs> you yeah. know, I'm working really hard. And if you can start to see it like a, a, it is a spiritual life, the, a, a sincere life dedicated to the arts mm -hmm. is one that is reflecting human life. That's our, we all have a different role to play in society and the artistic community has one job. See, I'd, I'd refer to it, I think she probably would too, as your vocation. Your vocation, it's a calling that's the right word. from God. Yeah, that's the you right know? word. And you And if you that. see it like that, it's lifelong. Right. And it, has, and it doesn't yeah. have a graduation. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? It, it, it doesn't. It keeps moving to a deeper place, absolutely. I remember you called me on set one time and you talked to me about your, your habits. And you were having like not a good time in the environment that you were in. You're like, but I feel so reassured by my own habits because I mm. realize even though I'm this is not my favorite job I've ever done, I'm still making friends. I'm still being nice to people. Huh. I'm still like existing yeah. as a person I can vaguely uh, like mm -hmm. recognize and understand because I've been doing this so long that my body knows how to hmm. be here and knows how to do this. I have good habits in my work and I, it, it stayed with me and that about when you have the opportunity to practice good habits um, through your, just like they'll help you they'll help you and through hard times. You know, and the script is about that in some ways, isn't it? Because of the, her experience at the Iowa, you know, writers of school, the role that Robert Lowell plays in her life, and that comes through in, in the script. Mentorship. Mm -hmm. Talk about Robert Lowell, because I found him an intriguing character in mm -hmm. the script. He's called Cal. I don't know why they call him Cal, but that was that his was nickname. That was his nickname, Caliban. Yeah. He, they, right. he was a tricky guy. That, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. It was a nickname okay. based on That's Caliban came from. from a Tempest. But talk about that, because he's an intriguing figure to me in the script. Can I start and then kick it to I you? I think you should start. Uh, I find it extreme. I've been learning a lot about feminism through my relationship with my daughter, like a lot of men do, uh, with our relationships. Anyway, but Robert Lowell, there's a lot of men in Flannery's life that are really pivotal yeah. in us having that copy of that book, like without yeah. the support, like yeah. so this idea that men weren't supporting women, you know, there's a lot of men there, but it's very interesting because Sometimes it has the smell of handing out the favors, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate. Yeah. And like, in, 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 uh, Robert Lowell was a real champion. There were many men who were a champion. And, but it, 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 it was so difficult. You know, when Flannery gets, you know, when you're a great artist, you touch society and society's going to have problems with you. you know, she's not an angel. She's nobody's perfect person. She is a human being with many flaws. Mm -hmm. And, but it was very tough to be, um, an aspire. If you mm -hmm. aspired to write serious yeah. fiction, like I want to be like Kafka. I want to be like Dostoevsky. Right. I, and, and top tier and you, writer. I want to be the real thing. I'm, yeah. and I'm willing to do the work. I'm doing the reading. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a sincere, I have a sincere spiritual life. I'm trying to write about serious life and death issues to give to other people and I want to do it. And 
to a large extent, you know, it was m men could be generous and help you along. There was no avenue for her to march down. Mm -hmm. She had to like, yeah. burn a path. Forge her own path. You know, yeah. And it was very difficult. And so a lot of the, a, a handful of men were really kind and really supportive. And we we're grateful to them for that. But it was still really hard hmm. because, you know, even like that we dramatized that one of our first rejections from Wise Blood is the reaction of, from the publisher was, yeah, you're terrific. Now take out that bit and take out that bit <laughs> yeah. and take out that bit and we'll publish it. You know, it's yeah. like, no, I, I'm really trying to write a new kind of novel and I really want you to believe in it. And that takes such... Yeah, she stuck I mean, to, to her guns in a way of, that was extraordinary And what time. is the right manifestation of pride, yeah, right? Because right. well, yeah. they would say, honey, I let you in this office. Honey, I'm inviting <laughs> you into the club. Just play by the rules. Yeah. Like, it's, I belong in this club. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't have to, you, you know, and it, it's, that's where the subtlety yeah. of systemic sexism, systemic racism, so all this is really subtle because a lot of the people that think they're doing you a favor are actually doling out the pennies in a way that is mm -hmm. insulting. Yeah. Mike, go ahead. Some of it is, I mean, some of it's subtle and some of it's explicit and like the, you know, a lot of men like I mean there was the Fitzgerald as a couple too but like uh, had to mm -hmm. kind of come forward and 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 be Flannery teachers and buyers partly because there's no network of uh powerful women to you know to to do to have that role mm -hmm. um and and to bring forth other young women and the network that exists encouraged women to believe that they were primarily in competition with each other and that any spot at the table for one of them was uh taking, a, the, spot. taking the spot of someone else um and so uh, and you know, and yeah, and that exists in in the racial landscape. In the female, I mean, it's just like all you know. There's plenty of spots for as many different white men, but like there's just there's not there's only one seat at the table for, and so everyone's in competition with each other, mm -hmm. and and then there's no support of each other, and then the network breaks down. Um, but what I think is the intention of the Robert Lowell Flannery relationship mm. in the movie yeah. is both to sort of demonstrate the life she didn't get to live. Mm -hmm. She lived this very small life where she did get to learn a lot and grow in the person she was and the way she thought about the world at 17, where she just had the influence of her mother and aunt and, mm -hmm. and Georgia and the person that she was when she died were very different and she grew a lot. But she didn't get the life she could have had mm -hmm. and the mind she could have had and the way she might have changed her mind about the world if she'd had the opportunity to live in the world. Uh, and experience love and change and friendships and independence and living by herself and, um, you know, might have really been different. And so we wanted to sort of show the window of what could have been mm. possible if it had not been for the lupus. Yeah. Um, and he was kind yeah, of the one right. person. I mean, I don't know if she would cop to this, but she has a line about him that he is a kind of grief, grief to, to me. me, you know, is that the one sign we can find in her letters of, of somebody she really yeah. had a love for yeah. was him and and it seemed that when when that went away combined with the loop she just didn't have any much hope for herself yeah. with romantic love and you know, she's very clear often as i don't want to be a nun yeah right you know i I've, right. i think i'm becoming a nun and you know lord i, I that's i don't want that do, yeah. I, do yeah. I have to go clear, that right? path i I, <laughs> yeah. I would rather not be a nun i yeah. want love i want to feel i want to be loved yeah. Um, but I want she friendships. I want adventure. I, she, I don't want to go back to Georgia, but it, but, she but she didn't she get was, that. Yeah. But you know, constrained by the illness, certainly. I yeah, like. and that was the blow. You know, that's that's what opened her up to her great wisdom and what restricted her. You know, what the Hilton Hall yeah. says that thing is her, her regionalism is her great strength and her great setback. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Yeah. 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 Tell me about so um, at the end, you you close with the, the image of the peacock, and of course she loved pea fowl. She always called mm -hmm. them. You know, had this kind of interesting relationship with these with animals, and uh, the peacock especially. And it was the great display of of the tail feathers that she saw as an anticipation of the second coming of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That it was like the the culmination of all things. It was in the it was like a like a rose window. All the elements within the, well, the feathers I of the peacock. You know. It's like an integrated vision of things. It's the world having come together. It's, it's and the fact that, you know, the, again, a peacock's kind of a difficult animal, yeah. uncooperative. <laughs> it will show this display when it 
when wants it feels to. like it. See, but that's that's also grace. I mean, we can never control God. I mean, we can never control. And we don't understand it. No, and, and, and it manifests itself. But it's like James Joyce's line about, you know, my job as a writer is to report epiphanies when they happen. Mm -hmm. So I can't control epiphanies, but they happen But they sometimes. do happen. And then the writers are, oh, let me tell you about that. And she, I think, was a great reporter of epiphanies in a very distinctive way. And the peacock is an amazing symbol that really hadn't, been, yeah. really hadn't been used. I see it as, I can't believe, like, when you sit in Notre Dame, yeah. in one of the great cathedrals around the world, they look... the. Feathers look like a giant stained glass window in Notre Dame. Yeah. Or a stained glass window in Notre Dame looks like peacock yeah, feathers. Right. It also looks like the galaxies. Uh, right. It looks like the planets. Right. And it looks like outer space to me. Yeah. It, they look like eyes. Y you know, just, just so many eyes. And I find it, mm -hmm. you know, seeing. Yeah. Are you seeing? Are you really looking? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. And I think all that is there, but what moves me about it more than almost anything else is that's the pinnacle for her, the peacock. Yeah. But you can trace back through her life this love of birds. Yeah. And chickens. Um, the chicken walking chickens. backwards. Who loves chickens? chickens? Like like <laughs> yeah. doves. Like and yeah. it's so it's there, there is of course the majesty of the peacock and the tail, but in the core there is a lifelong love of birds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you read and, that? How do you and 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 uh, the birds that are mundane mm -hmm. as well as ones that are spectacular. Yeah. And for someone who lived their life so, I mean, just so caged, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and 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 grounded, and contained, I. But who looked up at the cosmos yeah. and saw infinite possibility, um, and 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 the potential for majesty, to have this fascination with. B both flighted and flightless birds. Mm -hmm. You know, the peacock and the chicken are both, she was a bit of both relatively huh? flightless <laughs> birds. Yeah. Um, and and so, to me, that is what is so moving about it, is to have love for the most beautiful painting you've ever seen that's hanging at the Met, to have love for a child's drawing. Mm -hmm. um, a, yeah. You know, a car like the, the spectrum of what is possible in the yeah. arts and all the different people that is possible to do it, to have, to have love for a pigeon right. and to have love for a peacock. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and this ambition and connection towards the sky mm -hmm. um, and, and, and towards nature, yeah. which is like if, you know, if, if you're ever, conf like if you, don't, if you don't feel connected to God at church, maybe go for a walk. You know, yeah. I, like I, you know, I, I, I grew up, um, not in any kind of disciplined um, practice of faith, but I grew up with a disciplined practice of na of nature, um, of of walk and of going on classical spiritual path, walks yeah. in the woods and yeah. um, and seeing different parts of the world and playing with stones and walking through streams and looking at frogs and salamanders and yeah. and being and, and getting in cold water and feeling what that feels like and um, on a hot spirit like and all of the different physical sensation, connection to other people, connection to your body, connection to the world that being in nature can give you mm -hmm. and can give you to other people that you've never met before. You can hike up to the top of a mountain um, on one of those trails and watch the sun hit the trees as it's going down and you realize that you've all got to walk down and you're standing with five other people you've never met before at the top of that mountain and you feel so connected to them. You all went on this hike. You're all sweating. Mm -hmm. You all are aware of your body and aware of the sky. And those people are your friends and your people in your community. All of a sudden, instead of an, a them, it's an us. Yeah. It's the us that walked up the mountain. Yeah. And that's what we're all trying to do is turn as many people in the world as possible from thems into uses. Mm -hmm. And whatever way you know how to do that um, is good. And I, so I see... To me, the birds are how I connect my relationship mm. to spirituality, to Flannery's. Yeah. Even though we grew up in such different ways, is that there's that nature is the connective tissue. Yeah, that's good. That's a classical spiritual path. Well, say, I, to, I didn't say, I'm not I'm trying to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> no, but it's beautiful. I mean, entering the nature is, is yeah. one of the paths to God, you know, oh, for sure. classically. How about the chicken walking backwards? Because you begin with that, and it's this wonderfully Flannery, quirky thing that well, as so, a young girl. It, it, couldn't be, it couldn't be any more... Flannery O'Connor, I think it's, I wrote it out here, when she was, yeah. when she was a kid, she was, uh, Pathé Newsreel came to see, came right. to Georgia to film her, do I have my glasses? Um, 
because she. Uh, and I don't this think is a I real do. event in her life. This yeah, really happened and, as, and, um, when she was a girl. You know, here's an odd. And then in silent film, they do this because it seems like it's. I mean, it happened when she was seven or something, yeah. and it seems like she could have written it. Here's an right. odd fowl <laughs> that walks backwards to go forward, uh, who could look behind to see where she's going. Right. I mean, it's, it's so. It's right out of her stories. It's right out it? of her stories. <laughs> and, and it's. It's in a way, and th but Pathé News did it, and they're just being kind of funny, but she is an odd fowl that walked backwards to go forwards, to right. look behind, to see where she's <laughs> going ahead. It's like, it's so perfect. And it's kind of a circle, you know, the symbol of a circle was very important to her. And, yeah. uh, and it's, I just find it, it's just such an odd thing. You really taught right. me about this when I was a kid, but because but it, I've thought about it all the time, and it's interesting to think about it while you're making a, a, a life into a story. Is our human lives are not stories? Mm -hmm. um, like events are random and without necessarily metaphoric connection, and they only you're only the hero of your own story in as much as you can convince yourself that you are, <laughs> um, and and then draw your own metaphoric connections based on random events that actually have nothing to do with each other, like. Oh, I saw a red cap in a puddle yesterday, and then I, that girl at the coffee shop had a red cap, and maybe she's, I'm in love with her now, you know, like, and because I saw the caps, and so it's magic. Um, and maybe it's magic, maybe it's not. Um, and it, it is if you decide that it is. And the connection of the birds and opening with the chicken, and there's a very important chicken joke to me later in the story, and the peacock at the end, and mm -hmm. the connective tissue is how you take a life and turn it into a story. And you can do that for yourself and you can do that for someone else. And maybe it's the true story. Maybe it's not. Maybe those are the important moments. Maybe they're not. But well, it, is, it is important to note that we don't know. What's wonderful about Flannery O'Connor is we can read her writing and get to know her. Maya and I and our collaborators set out to make our, mm -hmm. how Flannery inspires us. Mm -hmm. So, And that's the thing about a biopic, the genre of yeah. it. It's very important. It's like... Um, painting a picture of somebody. It's not them. It's our yeah, picture sure. of them. We've chosen yeah. certain aspects to highlight certain, you know, our story ends when she's 25 years old, you, you, you know? Um, and a lot of that was, I was sitting there going, how do I make a movie about Flannery O'Connor with Maya? She, I've been hired to do such a thing. I don't like <laughs> old age makeup and stuff like that. I want to I wanna focus it in a concise period yeah. of time when she was, and then I got You're lucky right when I realized what a pivotal moment, this was the moment in yeah. Flannery's real life where it all went down. Her father died of lupus, she got diagnosed with lupus at Maya's age, and for a brief period of time, she thought she had days to live. And this was a very, this was, the, this was her grace moment where yeah. she was knocked sideways. She had a huge life she thought she was gonna have. See, and that's why I thought you chose Wildcat, because the Wildcat story is about a, a man who's waiting for this yeah. Wildcat to come and kill him, and when's it going to happen? I don't know. It, yeah. it happened before, and it might happen again. And, <laughs> and she lived her whole life in a way under. under the, the next gun, interview right? I do, that's the answer That'll I'll the answer, give. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because no, it, it, it is right, but also that's the story she wrote around. Really, we didn't include that one because yeah. I'm trying to include where she arrived at with yeah. her writing, but. It's a wonderful short story, and it is one that she wrote when she was around Maya's age. Very you know? young, and yeah. it's the yeah. waiting for death and wait fear. What's you the know? line from uh, A Good Man's Hard to Find? Yeah, she would have been a good woman if she had been somebody to shoot her every day. Yeah, she would have been a good you woman know? if she had somebody to shoot her every day of her life. <laughs> and, and, you know, that, that story riddles people's brains over and over again for the last 70 years. I mean, it's just so... Cause, you sense from the author that she kind of likes that murdering misfit. <laughs> yeah. And you sense from the author that she's very judgmental of the woman that he, it's like, who's the bad guy in that story? Yeah, but see, to your point, Maya, she realizes how, how connected they are. You're one of my own children. Yeah, that's the grace. The that and that's, it's the grace, yeah. yeah. And she ends up, even though she's shot to death, she's looking up to heaven with a smile on her face. Yeah. There was a moment of grace for her, that, uh -huh. that uh, encounter. It, it, it's very, it, that story catches our interconnection very beautifully and and also this woman's fear of the misfit and everything almost invites him into her life 
Yeah, right. You, you know, she's the one obsessed right. with the newspaper article <laughs> about them and everything. Yeah. And then she's so arrogant. She wants to take them. She thinks she remembers exactly where it was. She gets her whole family lost. It's actually yeah. her fault they're even there. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, she said right. she's talking about Gone with the Wind, being yeah. brilliant, and, you know. I'm sure you heard her uh, reading of that story. Yeah. Which, Once or twice. How can you not? I, I mean, I can't read her without hearing that voice. Oh, I know. Once I heard it. Uh, it's so extraordinary. What's the and first lines? Where? Grandmother didn't want to go to Florida. She wanted Florida. to visit some of her connections in East Tennessee. And she yeah. was seizing every yeah. chance to change Bailey's mind. I can't read any of her stories without hearing yeah, that too. voice. You know, and it's not just the Southern drawl. There's something there's so just perceptive. Oh, it's, in it's that, also in a very uncliche Southern. Which one of the part of that Maya's challenges of playing her is it's a Southern Georgia with a wild intellect yeah right. with you know she's not saying you know hey y'all right let's let's go get the cows some dinner you know i mean she's <laughs> right. talking about wild ideas yeah, and dostoevsky yeah, yeah. right <laughs> what was let me get maybe close with that what was the biggest challenge i this had a lot of challenges i imagine it's playing her but then playing what seven other characters how about playing flannery though what was the biggest challenge as an actor well the biggest fears and the yeah. biggest challenges are different. Okay. The biggest fear is I'm going to make a fool of myself. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, my accent won't be believable. I'm going to look stupid. Um, I, like you know, I, I'm not right for this. But you know, th those are those are fears. Mm -hmm. um, the good thing about the fear things is that they're mostly either things you can totally control. Um, or things that you can't control at all. At all. Yeah. Um, right. Like there's the fear that your accent will be terrible, like, work really hard at it. Maybe it'll still be terrible, but you can really try. Yeah. Um, and, like, you know, you're going to make a fool of yourself. Well, read the stories a lot, read the script a lot, know what you're doing. Like, you can really try. Um, mm -hmm. And then, like, you're going to be bad, maybe. Like, you know, you can't control that. You either right. you are what you are, um, yeah. and you will be what you will be, and people will think you are whatever it is that they think. Um, the real biggest challenge was, I think, maintaining... I, I mean, was maintaining her ferocity, mm -hmm. r rage, yeah. um, uh, loneliness, um, and not an intelligence, and not becoming totally depressed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and and, and, <laughs> and totally isolated. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, that was the. I remember having feelings while we were filming where I was like I think I'm the loneliest person in the world <laughs> like and I and I wasn't we were living together yeah. I have friends in the movie like like yeah. and so they were but not my feelings um, but you invite those thoughts into your imagination right. and they, they set fire and they set yeah. fire and so th that that was the biggest challenge actually was was not a allowing that to go too far um Listen, thank you both. I, I so enjoyed the conversation. I could talk about Flannery O'Connor all day. Clearly so could yeah. we. Yeah. Yeah. No, and you can too, but I, I love the script and I look forward to seeing the movie and I think it's oh, a I really think you're going to like it. And I actually really learned a lot on this interview. I really appreciate it. It's really it. helpful. I really mm -hmm. uh, I like the way you think. And I, it's funny because I'm editing it now and it's... Im I'm now so caught up in the movie. It's nice to talk to somebody like, like oh, wait, what did you like about Parker's back? Yeah. yeah. Right, that's what I liked about it, too. Yeah. Gotta make sure, I gotta get that shot back. <laughs> yeah. that, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, yeah, good. right, I cut that line. I gotta put that back in. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Thank you both again. Delight being with you. Thank yeah, you yeah, so yeah. much. Wonderful.